them guide their field research. So that's what, you know, some people are more theoretical intensive, some people are more field experience, case experience intensive, and what we do is we share, um, and as you progress through your education, and as you come closer to dissertation time, this is stuff that you really need to, uh, to, to arrive at mastery. Okay, so that concludes the fifth part, procedure. So this is going to be four, four dimensions of four dimensions of narrative space. And as I said earlier, I wanted to uh, I was going to return to this concept of narrative space and talk about narrative space in, in more detail. And uh, now is the time to do that. The first uh, narrative space that we can discuss in no particular order is personal. Personal slash social. And this is defined by interaction, I-N-T-E bar. Personal or social space, right? It's defined by the interaction, right? The interpersonal, right? So actually, let me write this down. You can have inter... Interpersonal between me and another individual. Then you can have the intra-I-N-T-R-A. You can have the intrapersonal, which is interaction, sort of self-reflection. And then you can have the social. And it's sort of my interaction with the larger society as a whole, right? My interaction with larger society as a whole, right? Many, many different people. So interpersonal, intrapersonal, and uh, social interaction. This is a great dimension for narrative um, space. There's a lot. There's a lot that can be done outside of academic writing. I'm completely uh, enamored with creative writing. I love creative writing. I think that the best academic writing has a very uh, sort of prose based undertone to it. You know, it doesn't read as methodically. Even though I love methodical reading, like really rigorous, almost robotic, philosophical tractatus reading, I do like that a lot, and I like to write like that. But um, um, in creating narratives, in understanding, rather, narrative space, especially interpersonal and social, um, in writing your texts, right, in writing your texts, you want to make the space pliable. You want the reader to have a feeling that I know what it's like to live in that space, right? It doesn't have to be the case that um, I can't relate to the experience, right? You want the individual, the reader, your committee members, to be able to relate to the experience. And the way that you relate it um, in, in just regular creative writing is you situate the setting, right? Here's the setting. On the corner of blah, 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 at this time of the year, with this amount of traffic, people are wearing this type of clothing, here is my participant, story begins, right? Set this, create a setting. Um, really, really good research does the same thing. It's not as prose-based, it's not as sort of, um, it's not as uh, creative in that sense, but you do need to set the space. Um, and in describing this narrative space, um, what you'll do through your research is you'll have a greater understanding of the role that the space plays on the individual. As I said, one of my graduate students just did a, um, research and defended her dissertation on um, uh, space and the spatial relation on personal identity. How does space affect my identity? It's really, really great, um, very, very fertile grounds for research, and her research was very, very good. So, um, recognizing the importance that space has on personal identity, on the formation of story, on the formation of folklore, all of this, again, is very, very fertile for uh, further qualitative research. So, personal and uh, social space is one dimension of narrative space. The next thing to recognize is that when we're talking about um, dimensions of narrative space, um, we can't talk about space without contextualizing space within time, right? And I'm not going to get into the whole Kantian space-time thing, but there is a, an even deeper underlying significance of this that is way outside of the discourse on uh, qualitative methods research. But you can't talk about space without talking about time. You can't talk about time without talking about space. You sort of get space-time as a unit. So anytime we're talking about narrative space, narrative space is always situated within time. And it's, as I said before, past, present, and future. 
at the past, present, and future. Um, right. In insofar as we're talking about narrative space within past, present, and future, we'll see that the relationships that individuals have with them, with uh, with sort of self-reflection with themselves, with other people, you know, family members and so on, or members in their community, um, is going to change. Right? It's going to change over time, and it's this change. It's this. It's as I said in um, personal experience stories. It's these episodic changes that serve uh, to thematize the research. Here's when I was young. Here's when I, I was older. Here's when I, here I am now. Here's how my mentality changed at this age. Here's how I thought about certain things in my life at this point in my life. Here's how I thought about things in my life in a different sense, right? These things um, are time sensitive and you want to make sure um, that you as a researcher using the narrative research model identify um, points in time and the questions, the interview questions that you that you eventually create and a good narrative, not even just narrative, good quality, well it depends on what type you're doing. Good narrative research, you're thinking anywhere from maybe t 10 to 20, probably no more than 20 research questions, right? You're going to have, not research questions, uh, interview questions, you usually have about one or one solid or maybe two research questions, but your interview questions, maybe 10 to 20 research questions. In your research questions, you should you should recognize that some of your research questions should address time, right? Tell me about the difference in time from this point and this point. Because time questions, questions which are time sensitive, and I don't have enough time to get into uh, the amount of detail that I would like to. Um, this is just an introduction. But questions which are time sensitive will give you uh, a fertile, fertile ground for sort of comparative claims, right? At this point in my life, I did this, I thought this. At this point in my life, I did this, I thought this. I thought differently at these two points in my life. Here's why I thought differently. Right? It's that why that we want, because that why serves as um, the sufficient condition to account for the change in perception or blah, 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 blah. Okay, enough of that. Number three, place. Right? It's called narrative space. So you can't really do narrative space without addressing uh, place. Place. Place is obviously going to be situational, right? Place is going to be situational. Um, I lived in this place for uh, this amount of time while I was there. Here's what I experienced. Then I moved, or I've lived in this place uh, my entire life. And here's the significance that living in this place for my entire life has, and, and so on. Um, environmental influences on the narrative. Uh, so that's, that's sort of obvious, right? And then lastly, number four, uh, deconstruction. deconstruction of uh, the narrative space, right? Um, it's important to recognize that in the process of um, interviewing participants, and interviewing is an art, by no means am I suggesting I'm uh, the greatest qualitative researcher. I have I probably have, in actual interviews, I probably have maybe 30 hours under my belt. In data interpretation, I have a couple hundred hours under my belt. Um, but I mean, compared to you know people who've done epic, epic qualitative research, I'm, I'm a neophyte. So I'm learning um, as well as a young researcher. In in the next few years, what I want, what I anticipate doing is doing a lot more qualitative research, a phenomenal amount more of qualitative research. Um, maybe collecting you know 50 to 100 hours worth of of, of data, and then spending you know two, three, four years analyzing that data. And the reason that I want to do it is because I want to go back and deconstruct this data. Right? I'm not going to get into sort of deconstruction properly now. It's not the time and the place. But deconstruction, not really in the technical sort of, uh, not in sort of Derrida's sense of deconstruction, some, something similar to that. But what you want to look for is what's implicit in the, in, in the interview, right? What wasn't said? What, was the, what, what could have been said that wasn't said? When asked certain questions, why was it that certain um, uh, participants remained solid, that they didn't respond, or that their response was vague, right? Um, I want to look at some of the social roles that may be informing their responses, right? All of this um, is very, very difficult to do because unlike the hard scientists who have formulas and proofs that they can measure against, all you really have as a social scientist is what was stated in the interview.
that's really it. Everything else, all of the structure of the research has to come out of your mind. Right? And it's not easy to do because there is no guide. This is really the only guide that, the, that, that there is, right? Um, publications that talk about how to do narrative research, that really is it. And even that, there's a huge room for, and I think it's a good, good thing, there's a huge room for creativity and qualitative research. So that you and another colleague might be doing exactly the same research on exactly the same people using exactly the same method and you'll have diverse um, results. Why? The diversity in that results um, have to do with how you deconstruct this data, right? How is it that you interpret and made sense of the data depending on what theoretical model that you use? So it's important to recognize that um, sky, the sky really is the limit um, when it comes to, when it comes to uh, um, narrative research and qualitative research, but it's on, on you as, um, as a researcher to figure out which of the six modes, and there are more, but which of the six modes of research best suit your interests, and then use that mode of research to guide your interests. And that's, that's, that's basically all you have. So, I mean, there is a lot of room for creativity, um, provided your, your uh, committee members will allow you that room for creativity.